And today we're going to be talking about something that I know for a fact plagues a huge number of e-learning designers. It's something that plagued me for a very long time when I first started out in e-learning. And it's something that I think is something I get asked about. It's one question I get asked more than any other question. And that is, how can, oh, I'll get my slides working here. How can I create uh, better looking e-learning courses? So let me start out by asking the group, and again, you can respond via chat. How many of you guys today struggle with the graphic design aspect of e-learning? And how many of you ask this question to yourself or to others? And you can respond via chat or give a little hands up with your, with your icon uh, in, the, in the participant window. But how many of you guys struggle with graphic design part of e-learning? OK, so Diane, you raised your hand. Rebecca, I see you're saying yep. And I'm seeing a lot of people uh, typing. Yeah, and a lot of people, they get better over time, so um, good to hear that, Rachel. Well, good. Yeah, it's something that I, uh, I struggled with a lot when I first started creating uh, e-learning courses, and it's something that you get better with over time. But some people just really, really, really struggle with the graphic design aspect of e-learning. And it's a funny question. This is a funny question because it's not an easy one. And I've always struggled on how to answer this question for people I get asked all the time, how to create better looking e-learning courses. So now that we know that when it comes to e-learning develop, most of us struggle with graphic design. The next question is, well, why is that? Why is it that so many people struggle with graphic design? And for those of you who uh, have overcome your struggles with graphic design, please feel free to share via chat what were some of the reasons why you struggled with graphic design. Yep, great answer, Rachel. Um, a lot of instructional designers, uh, or a lot of schools don't teach uh, graphic design when you go to school for instructional design work. <laughs> Response clients, yes, I could, I, I can relate to that on more, more ways than I think I should probably share today. But clients can be a, a roadblock. Copyright, oh, that's a good one. I haven't heard that one before. No, no formal training. No knowledge of Photoshop, OK, so technical. Takes focus and concentration, hard when wearing many hats. I would agree with that as well. We have a few more people typing. I'll let you guys finish before I continue. No formal training, required design and develop e-learning. Yep. So, the reasons why people struggle with graphic design are different depending on what your background is and depending on what you're, you're ultimately trying to accomplish. I do have a few theories about why people struggle with graphic design when they're first getting out in e-learning. Uh, and the first one is none of us, no matter who you are, not a single one of you, including myself, grew up dreaming of being an e-learning designer when we were a kid. And this is a picture of me when I was a child. I did not dream of being an e-learning designer. None of you dreamed of being e-learning designers or instructional designers. Uh, we dreamed of being other things like lawyers or actors and, um, and architects. Those are some of the things uh, that I wanted to be. But I never dreamed of being an e-learning designer. It's not something uh, for some of you, and I'm, I, I apologize, I'm, I don't want to put you down, but some of you, computers weren't even in, in existence when you were kids, uh, let alone e-learning. Uh, so there, there's a lot of roadblocks starting out from when you were a kid, but none of us dreamed of being e-learning designers. Uh, the second theory that I have is this. And can anyone describe to me what this is on the screen? PowerPoint templates, yes. Um, I think we've been conditioned to create really bad looking slides and content for our learners. Whether you were an instructional designer or now you're creating e-learning, the first thing you see when you open up PowerPoint or even Storyline and Captivate or any other authoring tool, it's something that looks like this. It's a blank screen and you have these areas of content where you can start adding bullet points and lots and lots and lots of text. So this is my, uh, I think I'm on my third reason, or second reason, why I think uh, people struggle with graphic design is the tools that we use really don't help us uh, from the beginning of creating really good looking courses. The third reason, and you may disagree with me on this one, but I think our education system has something to do with it. Being the liberal self that I am, I do not think we're challenged enough to be creative when we're growing up in school. And I think it's getting worse. Um, you know, when I was a kid in high school, um, 
uh, I was required to go take an art class. I was required to be, I think I was required to take a theater class. I was required to do these artsy things. And now uh, my, my younger brother, he is actually 10 years younger than me. And when he was in high school, he did not have a single um, class that was required of him that required him to be creative. Uh, I think our education system has turned into a system where we train students to remember information and then recall it later in a standardized test to evaluate whether the teachers are doing good or not. And then come summertime, you forget everything that you learn. So uh, I think our education has, system has something to do with that. But that's just my opinion, of course. And then lastly, I think some of us are just programmed differently. We've all heard the ideology behind being left-brained versus right-brained and how that influences us uh, in our everyday lives. And let me ask you guys, how many of you today would consider yourself left-brained or right-brained to go ahead and respond via chat? A lot of people saying left-brained. Michael, right-brained? I am right-brained as well. And, and Rachel, uh, have you never heard of uh, the, the theory behind left brain and right brain, Rachel? Oh, no problem. So there's this, this ideology behind which side of your brain is more dominant. And people who are left brain tend to be more A-type personalities. They're logical. They're very good with math and literacy and all of that stuff. And then people who are right brained tend to be a lot more uh, creative. I am definitely a, a right-brained person. Uh, I am horrible at math. I am horrible at grammar. I'm horrible at all of those things that uh, we expect people to be really good at in the business world. But I am very, very creative. And, and actually, um, the only math that I'm really good at is geometry, which is interesting because geometry is very visual. It shapes numbers, colors, stuff like that. So. Uh, I am very right-brained, but I think some of us are programmed differently, and I think that has a big influence on um, how creative we are when it comes to uh, graphic design. And uh, Tisha, I see you said you're smack dab in the middle. There are very few people that I know are smack dab in the middle, and uh, one of them, uh, Diane Elkins, which is my boss, and she's the author of the eLearning Uncovered books. She is. She must be a genius because she is so very A-type personality, but she is incredibly creative and she sees things. She sees things creatively, but she's also very good at math and on all that stuff. So people who are smack dab in the middle, um, you're like, you know, superheroes to me because I just don't get that at all. So uh, the thing about graphic design that makes it so uh, the thing that I think makes graphic design so challenging, especially it relates to e-learning, is it's a balancing act between uh, conflicting priorities. So on one side, when you're doing e-learning, you have the content. And we're always told content is king. Everything is content. You start with the content. You edit the content the most. You review with the content the most. The content is where you involve your subject matter experts. It's content, content, content. And then on the other side, you have the graphics. And I feel like graphics is a whole other uh, animal within itself. And it's not just a matter of creating right graphics. It's about creating graphics that works with the content. And there's so many things that go into graphics, whether it's color, shape, layout, imagery, repetition, pattern, texture, contrast, concept, volume, focus, perspective, size, balance, proportion, animation. All of these things play into graphics. And uh, I, think, I think a lot of times uh, people who get intimidated with graphics tends to kind of fall off the bandwagon as the important thing. For me, I feel like content and graphics are equally important. Your content is only as good as the way it's presented. Um, and your graphics are only as good as the content that's within it. Uh, you can have amazing content, but people are not going to absorb it or listen to it unless it's presented well. And the same thing with graphics. You can put lipstick on a pig, but at the end of the day, it's just a pig and it's crappy content and they're not going to learn anything out of it. So it's a balance of conflicting priorities and it can be really, really hard to strike that right balance. Uh, so coming back to our question about how can you create better uh, e-learning courses? Well, honestly, the truth is I don't know. <laughs> I don't believe there's any one single answer to that question. Um, I, I, I have a hard time answering that question for people, and uh, um, it, it, there isn't one single answer. However, I have learned over time that although I can't answer that question with a single eye-opening answer, I can provide you tips and methodologies that I've discovered over time that you can use to answer that question for yourself. 
Um, what I do for graphic design and what works for me to be a better designer is going to be very different than what works for you as a designer. And so I can provide you the tips and methodologies, but it's up to you to make yourself a better graphic designer on how you choose to use those tips. So uh, to help us get there, we're going to talk about three things today that, um, that I think are important uh, things for you guys to know about when it comes to being better graphic designers. The, the main thing we're going to talk about in our call, of course, is graphic layering. This is a methodology that I guess I claimed and I, I came up with uh, last year that I use, or it's a methodology that I discovered that I used. I didn't know I used it before. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about where to find inspiration uh, in your everyday lives. Uh, inspiration is around us all the time. It's just a matter of um, identifying it and knowing where to look for it. And then finally, I'm going to talk about some design trends, specifically design trends that people should stop using today. They're design trends that I see people continually using, um, and they're like from 1980s and 1990s, and they're just things that you shouldn't be doing anymore. So let's talk about what is graphic layering. So uh, graphic layering, here's my, I guess, formal definition. Graphic layering is a technique, of, uh, technique that, that layers or stacks several graphical elements on top of one another to establish the overall design. And this is something that uh, uh, I didn't even realize I was doing uh, until I wrote a blog post about this template that I had created. And I know some of you on the call today have probably seen this before. This is a template I created and I posted out on the Articulate community forums called my flat design e-learning template. And when I created this, I was trying to, uh, in my blog post, originally describe how it is that I came about creating this. And what I realized is I, had take, I took this, this particular slide and I turned it sideways like this and then I expanded it and I realized that my content and my slides was really made up of three layers. Um, on the very far right side you had the background layer. In the middle I had the interface and in the front I had the content. And I realized in a lot of courses that I create or templates that I would create and post out on the internet there was this consistent trend of me doing these three layers of the background, the interface, and the content. And then when they all work together really well, you get this end result of, a, of an entire slide. So uh, what I'd like to do is I'm going to switch over to Articulate Storyline. And um, for those of you, I know some of you are not, are, don't use Articulate Storyline, and that's totally fine. Um, I'm just using it as my design tool. But what I'll be talking about today applies regardless of the offering tool you're using. You could still use these techniques whether you're using Captivate or Lectora or any other offering program. So let me switch over to Articulate. And let's talk about, actually, let's talk about the background layer first. So the background is, uh, uh, the background, I think most people don't give credit to the background like they, um, like they should be. I, I think a lot of times people consider the background the least important part of the course. And I actually disagree. I think the background of uh, any course is the most important part. Uh, maybe not the most important part, but I think it's a big anchoring part of your course. The background is the one consistent thing that I think uh, applies, or it's the one consistent thing that will be on most 90% of all of your slides throughout uh, your content. And so it's important that the background, whatever you choose to do, works with your entire course. It's the anchoring piece. It's the foundation of your entire course. So I have uh, one, two, three, four, five, six types of backgrounds, uh, styles that I typically use whenever I'm developing e-learning. And I'll go through each of these, and I'll talk a little, about, a little bit about it, and I'll give you a couple examples. But when it comes to graphic layering, um, I do have a couple rules when it comes to the background. The background should always be neutral. Um, and, it, and it shouldn't distract from your course. But there's a lot of things you can do with the background. The background can establish a setting. Uh, it can establish the entire look and feel of a course, or it can just be something neutral in the background. So the first type of background that I typically um, work with uh, is a solid background. And like I said before at the beginning of the course, a lot of people, when they first open up PowerPoint or they're opening up Storyline, you get this blank canvas. And sometimes when people don't know what to do with their background in their e-learning courses, they'll leave it white. And that's okay, as long as you're doing it intentionally. And that's something that I'll be talking about, or I'll mention and reinforce as I'm talking about all of these different concepts, is the concept of intention. Uh, a lot of times people do things because they don't know what else to do. 
and that's not the right answer of leaving a background blank. I think it's always important that if you do something, you do it with intent. And it can be okay to leave a background blank as long as it's done with intent. And I've, I've, I've used white backgrounds before, but I've made up for it in other areas, whether it's my header or footer or the content. Um, but solid background can be a blank background. Or you can do different colors if you do a solid background. A lot of times, um, I'll make my background just a solid blue color like you see here. Whatever you do with a solid background, it should be, or yeah, with a solid background. And Tisha, I see your comment. My audio seems to be going in and out. Is anyone else experiencing that? OK, no problem. I'll just move a little bit closer to my computer here. OK, um, with, when it comes to a solid background, um, I always like to use neutral colors uh, with my background. It's important that when you're using solid backgrounds that the colors um, are in alignment with the overall design for your course. And I'm waiting for you, Tisha, before I continue just to see if you're still having audio issues. OK, I'll just try my best to, to speak up. And um, maybe you guys have to go through the audio wizard again or jump off and jump back in to fix the audio. All right, perfect. Uh, so solid backgrounds, there's not much more to say about it. It's just a solid background. I always always think it's important to keep it neutral and not do anything crazy with solid backgrounds. I think a lot of times, you know, when you look at the color palette here or you look at more of these field colors, you have all of these crazy colors. And there's nothing wrong with crazy colors like this fuchsia color. But as long as it's done with intent, um, I think that's OK. But neutral colors are anything that you can use throughout your course that is not going to distract from your main content, whether it's a nice blue or even uh, a dark black like you saw here in my, um, in my flat design. I just did a black, or it's kind of an off black color for my, um, my flat design. So that's um, solid background. The second kind of background that I often use is gradient backgrounds. And I have a real love-hate relationship with gradients. Um, another thing, like I mentioned before, when you first open up PowerPoint or you're working in Storyline or whatever and you do a gradient, and let me get my box set up here, and we're going to do a fill of gradient Go over here. We have some presets here, and I don't know why they offer these types of presets. Um, these presets, and I see Tisha, what about load time? Can you, uh, can you clarify what you mean by that? Lots of graphics on the page. So you're, I guess you're asking, how does that affect your load time? Um, it can affect your load time, I suspect. I, I imagine if, you know, I don't, I don't do a lot of work when it comes to publish sizes, but um, I imagine if you're using a lot of heavy graphics on your background, it can affect your load time. If you are doing that, uh, and I don't know, maybe somebody on the call today is more experienced than I am on this, but I believe if you, if you use your master slides, whether it's PowerPoint or anything like that, then that might reduce your load time because you're not really using that graphic more than once in your course. And I see uh, some people typing here. Uh, but I have never had an issue with lots of graphics on my page or background when it comes to load times in my course. Uh, we're not going to get too much into, I guess, graphic resolution. But uh, of course, don't use overly, I guess, high resolution graphics or high resolution video if you need your courses to load quickly. And then just like Rick said, set their background in the master, of course, which I'm not doing today just because um, it's not part of the presentation. And then, of course, I see Diane, you said, uh, or Rachel, you said, or, yeah, Rachel, you said crop your images. That's another great tip as well. So when it comes to gradient backgrounds, like I was saying before, I have a love-hate relationship with gradients. Um, when, you, when you look at some of the preset gradients that are provided in a lot of programs, whether it's Storyline or PowerPoint, you get these really, I'm trying to find a really ugly one here like this. I don't think I would ever use this in a course. But some rules when it comes to gradient backgrounds is, is I think gradients can be really good when they're really, really subtle. Uh, gradient backgrounds that are subtle tend to uh, be more pleasing to the eye. So even though you have all these preset colors, I ignore those. And I always create my own background. And I'm going to reset this one. Oh, I'll just choose like that one. And this one has three stops in the gradient. I'll just delete the middle one. 
And what I typically like to do when I'm doing gradients is I will do same color gradients, just two different shades of the same color. And you're kind of already seeing that here with the green. Uh, but when I'm using gradients, and you'll see an example of this later when I show you an example of a, a course I built. But whenever I'm building gradients, I'll typically do a same color type gradient here where I'm using two uh, shades of the same color. And this is still a little bit more of a dramatic gradient than I would like. Uh, we might do a little bit less of a gradient. And this is very similar to our solid background, but we have a little bit more interest in the background because uh, it is um, because it is a gradient. And I do have the border turned on here. I would typically turn that off. The gradient backgrounds, the solid backgrounds, very similar. They're they're just neutral in the background and they're they're solid and typically they stay static throughout the entire course. Texture background, this is one that uh, people don't use too often, um, but I think it can be nice. It can add a different type of flair to your, uh, to your background of your course. So again, if I insert a shape here, we'll go ahead and fill it up. There's a few options for adding texture to your, um, we'll go and format it. And this is the same thing that you might have in PowerPoint or in Captivate. You can do a pattern fill. And you all have all these different patterns for lines and shapes. Uh, one that I like to do is just a, a diagonal line that goes across. And uh, you can see here, even though I entered it, it's really harsh. You see all these lines, it's really harsh. And one thing I like to do is, again, backgrounds with, with lines like this, I think, should be really subtle. So oftentimes, I'll just take another box. We'll just take this one. And I will give it a white fill and make it a little bit transparent. And you can see there's a little bit of texture back there, but it's not too harsh. It's very subtle and pleasing to the eye. And once you start layering things on top of this, it'll start looking uh, a lot more interesting as a background. And of course, you can change the colors to whatever you need. Watermark backgrounds, this is another one that I like to use, especially when I'm working with client branding. Uh, if, if I don't have a whole lot to put on the background, if anything, I know that I can put the client's branding in the background. And one thing that I always hate whenever I'm working with um, a client project is when they require, and this is just a logo that I created, when they require the logo of their course to always be on their slide, like in the corner here. And the problem with that is it takes up a lot of real estate that you could use to present content on. So what I'll often do is I will take the logo and I will make it really, really big, maybe like this, and I will bring the transparency down, way down, so that it's a watermark in the background and not something that is uh, really bold and takes up space. And there's no problem with content going over this. The user can still see it. The learner can still see it. They can identify, though, this is the RQM course. This is our company. And uh, it's not taking up real estate. Even better than that, when it comes to using client branding, I don't ha you don't always have to have the entire logo on the screen. I'll use a part of the logo, which is easily identifiable, and make that part of my watermark. So we have the entire logo here. Well, what you can do is, I'm going to just crop out all the text. And we have the main part of the logo here, which is these little lines that represent charts. And this is a great way. This is something that's identifiable to the learners. It's identifiable to the organization. They recognize these lines. And now you have an interesting background. And Rick comments, it's best to use vector graph or graphics for watermarks. And I would, I would highly agree with that. If you're going to do anything where you're going to scale that logo really, really big, use a vector, um, a vector uh, image so that you can scale it as big as you want. Uh, and Diane comments, you have to be careful with using client logos. There's often strict requirements about how they can be used. I agree with that, Diane. There are, um, typically, people have branding standards. And you're not supposed to do certain things with the logo. Uh, you always want to follow that. But if you do have some latitude to make some changes, um, go ahead and, and uh, do what you want with the logo. And maybe, you know, experiment. Even though people have branding standards, it doesn't hurt to experiment and see if uh, they, um, you do something creative with it. And, you know, maybe they'll let you do something like this where you can break up the logo. But this is oftentimes how I'll use a... Um, a watermark as my background. And then lastly, this is one of my favorite backgrounds that I do is an image background. And image backgrounds are really versatile, I think, to making your courses look um, interesting. And they can also provide context for a scenario or a type of course that you're building. So I'll go ahead and insert a picture here. And we have a generic uh, office background. 
And uh, I like these types of backgrounds because, like I said, they're very versatile and there's a lot you can do with them um, to make your course interesting. Now, when it comes to image backgrounds, just like I was talking about with the texture background, if I were to leave the texture as, the, uh, as it is here, this would be really harsh to put content on top of. And that's the same thing when it comes to uh, background um, background images or layer or images as your background layer is if, if I left it like this it would be really harsh so just like I did with the texture background I'll often take a, uh, a white box and uh, and wash it out a little bit like you see here and I might even do it a little bit more just to, to get to get it to be um, more washed out so with this the user can see the background but it is not uh, so much distracting from the content. If you're doing a scenario, maybe this gives you context that the scenario is happening in an office or an office environment uh, or anything like that. This is one of my favorite types of backgrounds to do. So what I'll do now is I'm going to take this background, I'm going to build off of it and show you the two other types of, of uh, layers in my, I guess, graphic layering. That would be the interface layer and uh, the content layer. And Rick said, can you preview the scene to, to show them all? I will do that. Let me just get this back up here. So here's our, uh, our generic, um, I guess, a color blocked uh, uh, background. This is just a generic black background. Here's a gradient background. Here's the texture background. You can barely see the texture on the screen, but it is there. Here's a logo watermark background. And then, of course, our image uh, background with it washed out a little bit. So um, let's talk about, I'm going to take this now and we'll build off of this. Let's talk about uh, the interface layer. So the next layer that we have here is the interface layer. And the interface layer contains anything that uh, is either going to be interactive for the user. It might it be your header and footer, which might include some uh, custom navigation in your course, or any buttons on the screen is going to be contained within your interface layer. And I could talk a long time about the interface layer because I think there's a whole set of rules about designing interfaces when it comes to e-learning or any type of uh, interactive elements, whether it's web design or e-learning. I think there's a lot of rules when it comes to creating interface layers. But the important thing is I think interface layers need to contrast from the rest of your content um, dramatically enough so that the learner understands it's interactive. It doesn't help when your interface layer uh, looks the same as your content or your interface layer looks the same as your background because then your learner doesn't know uh, that's interactive. So that means making buttons look like buttons uh, and making headers look like headers and titles look like titles and not like um, your content. So in this example, I'm going to take this, uh, this background uh, that we've already built with the, the image and I'm just going to add some, some just really simple boxes here. Maybe this is going to be our header. Oop, put it there for some reason. And we'll get rid of our outline. So no outline. And then maybe we'll do the same thing with a footer. And maybe in this footer I would add um, some arrows down here or a next and previous button if I wanted to uh, make it uh, interactive. And the thing also about um, the interface layer is, is typically you can reflect a lot of the company branding that you might be working with through the interface layer. So I could make these the colors of my um, of my company's logo colors or their color palette. In this case, let's just choose. We'll just do. We'll leave it blue. I think blue is nice. Oops. Yep. We'll leave it blue. And we have an interface layer. Also on the interface layer that I forgot to mention. The interface layer uh, contains, and it's not really shown here in this example, but I think the interface layer needs to contain any uh, content staging areas. I call them content staging areas where you're going to be putting content. So let's say in this example I'm going to make a tabbed interaction and say this is my content area. And technically I could leave this area open and, uh, and I agree with you, Tisha. Blue is my favorite. It typically works with everything. I love blue as well. Uh, I could leave this area open as my content staging area for my interface layer, but I'm going to add a nice box here, and I'm going to give it a fill of white, and I'm going to give it no outline. Now, this is an example where you can um, play around with the different layers in your course to get a look and feel. So there's a lot of white going on here, and now you can't even see the background, but let's say I wanted to get rid of 
uh, this this washout that I put over the image. And now I can format this and give this a little bit of transparency. And so now we have an entirely different look and feel. Maybe this is, looks a little bit more um, flat or it's kind of like you know the Apple's iOS 7 on your iPhone where things are a little bit more transparent. Another thing you could do with this uh, is you could blur out the background in this area and make it look blurry so it's not so uh, it's not taking up so much of your content area. But in this example, I'm going to leave this, oops, wrong one. I'm going to leave the transparency off. I'm going to make it a solid white. And I will, uh, I'll leave the wash out. And I'm going to make it less predominant in this example. I'll just do a nice, simple wash out. So we have a header. Let me just type some text here. Give it a nice font here. Make it bigger. And my new thing that I've been doing a lot of is I've been doing a lot of right justification versus left or centered. I don't know why I think that looks nice as a uh, justification or right justification for the text. Uh, some things that you can do to to help you. Um, I guess uh, I'm trying to losing my word here. Oh, I can't even think of the word. Enhance, thinking of word enhance. Things you can do to en enhance the uh, interface layer is one thing I like to do is add drop shadows to things that go on top of the uh, background layer. And the thing about drop shadows is te people tend to, um, and I'm just going to do the show options, people tend to use drop shadows and they tend to abuse them. Here's a standard drop shadow. This one is a little harsh on here. Uh, you'll see a lot of times people add like drop shadows that look like this. They get rid of the blur here so it looks a little too harsh. Um, I like my drop shadows to be really subtle, like with anything. So we'll make the size really small. Bring it down here. So you can barely see the drop shadow there, but there's a nice drop shadow um, over this content area for my slide. And then you have the header and the footer, and I could do the same thing. I'll just do that real quick. I should be able to do it at the same time. So it's a little too harsh for me. I'll just bring down the transparency a little bit. Okay. So we've added some nice drop shadows. That helps it to pop off the screen a little bit um, more than um, just looking flat on the screen. So we have a header, we have a content area, and then we have um, our content staging area, I should call it, and then we have our footer. The last part of the interface layer is any interactive element. So let's say in this example, we're going to make a little tabbed interaction. And the thing about buttons is they should look different from anything else in your course. And I'm going to bring this down a little bit to give me some room. They should look like anything different in your course. They should not look um, like, for example, sometimes we'll take, some people will put their content in a box like this, and then they'll have a button up here, and then the button looks really, really similar to their content area. I don't like that because I don't know if this is a button or if this is not supposed to be a button, so I like to make my buttons look like buttons and everything else look not like my button. Uh, buttons should look unique from the rest of your content. So in this case, I'm going to give it, uh, and this is very atypical of me, I don't typically do black buttons, but I think it looks nice in this example. So I'll do a nice, maybe a little bit bigger. And slimmer. We'll just call this tab one. Oops. And I'll distribute those on the screen here. It's not perfectly centered, but there you go. Now, one thing that I like to do with any uh, interactive element that I'm creating for my course, and we'll just add the drop shadow as well. One thing I like to do with any uh, interactive elements that I am doing uh, in a course is I like to, to include states on anything that's interactive. Now, for those of you using Captivate, I know creating states 
is not as easy. And I don't, I'm not sure if you can create states in Lectora. Anyone who's a Lectora user might have to clarify on this. But for those of you who are Storyline us users, you're probably familiar with states. So one thing that's another pet peeve of mine is when people create buttons and then they don't give it a state um, so that I know as a user that it's something interactive. Is anyone not familiar with states? Okay, good. So states are simply, um, I guess, different versions of the same thing that uh, can change the look and feel of an object. And they're most commonly used in anything um, interface related or interface design related. And a good example is you can see as I hover over these tabs here in the interface of Articulate Storyline, you can see that they turn to this yellow color. That's an example of a state, and that's how you know it's interactive. So I typically like to add states to my content. And I'll just add a quick um, hover state. And in this example, our hover state is just going to give it a white outline to indicate that it is. And we'll make it a little thicker. I think that's good enough. So now, if I preview this, I get a nice little, a little visual indication that it's interactive. So I think that's important when developing interactive, um, the interactive layer. Or, yeah, interactive later. And then Brett says, I think the new version of Captivate has caught up with the other tools in respect to button states. Um, I'm not 100% sure on that. I, I worked on the Captivate 8 book for eLearning Uncovered, and I know you can still have to load them the same way, but I think there are a few additional options as well, like you mentioned, Brett. So, um, so here we just designed a simple slide here, and very, very similar to, um, wrong screen, very similar to this, we have a background, and now we have an interface layer. A background being our image, and then our interface layer being our header, our footer, our content staging area, and then our three buttons for these tabs that we've built here. Uh, the last layer is the content layer. And I think the content layer is actually the simplest layer to build. The important thing about the content layer is how you lay out your content. Uh, there is a lot of science behind what content you put on your screen that I think most of us are familiar with. You don't want a lot of text and you don't want a lot of bullet points, especially if you have audio narration to reinforce a lot of these things. Your content should really be very visual uh, at all costs. And one of the, I, I presented this uh, March at the Learning Solutions Conference. I, I presented 10 things I learned my first year in e-learning. And uh, one of my rules is, don't write anything you can't communicate visually. So if you can communicate it visually, by all means, that should be your default, is to communicate it visually. So in a simple example like this, your content might be something as simple as, I don't know, let's find a picture here. Um, hmm, I had a picture earlier. Let me just go grab it from one of my other slides here. We'll actually just use this as an example. So your content might just be a picture and then some text. Uh, these are just, this is just some sample text. You don't have to lay out text this way. Maybe you just have a paragraph of text, or you have no text at all, and you make this image fill up the entire content area. Here's another example of a different layout for a tabbed interaction like this. So we have a, a, a character here, and then we have some text. And then here's an example with no text whatsoever uh, on your content layer where you can have your content. So again, we have our content, the interface, and then the background. So what you ultimately end up with, uh, and I have a complete slide here. And so we have, a, and I added some nice animation to this to make it look nice. So here we have our, our interface, and we have a nice tabbed interaction like this. And then also on the last slide, I added some additional interactive elements. Uh, these are interactive. I don't know um, if I would define these as part of the interactive layer. I'd probably define them as part of the interface layer, even though they are interactive. Um, and it's indicated because it has the little pulsing, um, the pulse around the, the icon to let you know it's interactive. So that's an example of how you can use graphic layering in uh, your e-learning design. And I could go on and on and on with different, different examples of how to do this. Um, but like I said before, you have your, your background, your interface, and your content layer. So any questions about that before I continue on? Or any other, anything else you'd like to see with that specifically? I see Diane, you're typing.
Good point, Diane. Yes, you have to remind yourself to design with intent. You always have to ask yourself, uh, I, you always have to ask yourself, whatever it is you're doing, you have to ask, does this help um, reinforce my content or does it help communicate my content better otherwise? And uh, less is more, just like with content, when it comes to design, less is more. Uh, you can always strip things away and simplify, 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 and edit down, edit down, edit down. So that's just a brief overview of graphic layering. Uh, there is, again, there's no one right way to do graphic layering, but I think if you build your content with that in mind where you have a background and then you build on top of that an interface and then on top of that your content and then make it all look uh, seamless together, you can end up with something that uh, looks like a nice completed slide. So I want to talk about finding inspiration. Uh, this is another thing I get asked about a lot, and I think uh, uh, I was just somebody, um, I don't know, Michael, were you the one who just did how to find or how to, how to find inspiration on Twitter? I think this is the right Michael on the call today, right? Yes, Michael Jones. Michael Jones just did um, uh, a thing on Twitter where he asked everyone where they can find inspiration. And um, I'm always looking for inspiration. That's another important aspect, I think, that all e-learning designers need to start doing is looking around your environment all the time looking for inspiration. And I find inspiration in the weirdest locations. Um, the other day, um, or no, this was last year. Last year I was in a Columbia store and I was buying a jacket because it gets really, really cold. It gets horribly cold here in Wisconsin. So every year I have to make a trip to the Columbia store. And I took these pictures um, of their, uh, their graphic, I guess their graphics that they use in their store. And it struck me as really interesting in the way they laid out the content. So you can see here, this is the first thing you see. Um, uh, when you enter the store, you have this nice background, and then you have this simple strip here that goes across it that gives the content. I also liked, and this is kind of blurry, I liked how they laid out, uh, this is behind their registers, how they laid out the content, and I imagined, oh, okay, you know, here's, here's a graphic, and then here's some content about that, and then you have a nice background that reinforces it. And then I really liked this. I thought, oh, this looks like kind of like a header. And so what I did with that is I created this template based off of that. Uh, and this is a template I created in PowerPoint that kind of resembles what I saw in the Columbia store. So here's a nice title. Maybe this is a course that I'm building for a park ranger service, or who knows. But I just played with this, this layout. You can see here, this mimics very similar to that sign where you have the, the header up here, you have a strip here. The background, this is an example of a really subtle uh, gradient background. It, it adds to the course by you getting the hint of the color, but it doesn't take away from it, and it's not just white. Um, and then we have, of course, our content and our interface on top of that. So you can see how I used what I saw at the Columbia store. Here's an example of a jacket. Oops. Uh, with some tabs of information. One thing I'll mention about this that people tend to struggle with is people tend to really struggle with how to present bullet points in e-learning, and I'm always looking for alternative ways to present bullet points in my courses. So typically, um, people will just put the bullet points on the screen and put bullets in front of them, and I always think there's always, there has to be a better alternative to bullet points. So this is an example where you can use these three, um, I guess, content areas to represent bullet points and have that come out come on the screen one at a time. The important thing about this is is if you um, if you have any interactive elements that look like this, you don't want to confuse the learner by making them look the same as your buttons because someone could mistake these as tabs, mistaken them as tabs. And then Rachel said, uh, it looks like you took pictures in the Columbia store. Yes, <laughs> it kind of does, right? <laughs> Um, here's another one. Here's an example of a map, and again, some bullet points. Another, oh, another thing I was going to mention about bullet points is um, another alternative is, and I don't have an example, but I also like to take my bullet points and mock it up as a checklist, as a graphic. That's an easy way where if you have to have bullet points on it, you don't have to make them look like bullet points. Make it look like a checklist, and then it doesn't look like bullet points anymore. It looks like a checklist. Okay. Um, I also find inspiration whenever I'm out and about. So this is a great example. I was at a Starbucks, and I didn't take this picture. I pulled this one offline, uh, but I saw this in um, one of their stores. And this is a, I think this is an infographic, or it explains how, um, how, how much coffee and milk they have in uh, your drinks. And I was actually really surprised how much a cappuccino is. 
um, more milk than it is co coffee, which is kind of sad. Um, but this is a great example of real simplicity use of graphics and text in order to um, in order to represent information on a screen. So this is a great example of that. I also find inspiration uh, on TV. So I, I really, I don't know why, I have an obsession with the way MSNBC, uh, and I'm not promoting them, but the way MSNBC lays out their content, their headers, and no matter what show you watch, whether it's, uh, I think this one's Morning Joe, or you watch a show in the afternoon, they always have a header that looks very similar to this. They might change up the colors, and you have a footer here. So this might be something where you could do a layout that looks like this. This is something um, I get inspired by. I actually created a course based off this layout. I can't show it because it was for a client, but it's a great uh, use of information. Uh, infographics are another great source of information or a source of, uh, of inspiration. I love Star Trek. I'm a Star Trek geek, and so I found this infographic. And the thing I love using infographics for is inspiration on how to visualize data. So you can see here they're visualizing the number of, I guess, yellow shirts versus blue shirts um, that are, I guess, on a starship. I have no idea. But it's a great way of, of getting inspiration on how to visualize data. Here's a chart down here. Um, that might be an alternative to a boring bar chart or something else. So infographics are a great way to find inspiration. Web, there's always tons of inspiration on the web. Um, when you really think about it, think about how, um, and Diane, I agree, the screen is too busy. <laughs> I would totally agree with you. There's too much going on on the screen. But you can uh, use little bits and pieces of it to inspire or use on how you might present information. You don't have to use the entire thing, but maybe just maybe something as simple as the way it presents this title uh, can inspire you to create a header that looks this way or something else like that. Uh, the web is another great source of information or inspiration. Uh, when you think about it, e-learning and web interface design are very similar. Web interface design tends to be, uh, has a lot more content. You're not limited to the amount of content. But in terms of interactions and in terms of layout, uh, they're very similar. So here's a simple uh, website that has these tabs and has a header. And then you can see there's content areas as well. So this is a great source of inspiration for um, uh, e-learning design. I also find uh, inspiration in nature. Um, I took this picture uh, last summer or last spring. And uh, I took this picture as well. This is a picture I took of some leaves outside of my house. I do photography on the side. And I use both of these as inspiration to create this template that you guys might have seen um, on the Articulate Forms. I call this my spring green template. And you can see I, I took an image very similar to this and used it as my background. I blurred it out. And then the leaves, I use the leaves as inspiration um, in the content. And you can see here we have a very similar concept of graphic layering where you have the background. Again, it's blurred out image. And then you have a content area and then, or an interface area, and then your content um, there as well. So I use this as inspiration to create this course. OK. So any questions or any comments on inspiration or where to find inspiration? You just have to know where to look and then know how to take it and apply it to your designs. And I see Joyce, you're typing in the chat box. So I'll give you a second. Very helpful. Thank you. OK, so the last part, yes, and Rachel, I couldn't agree. I think inspiration can motivate you to practice and create more. One thing I'll also mention before I continue on is a lot of these examples that you see here, these are not actual client examples that I developed for clients. These are templates. And so one, a great way that I always tell people to practice your graphic design so that you can become better at graphic design is to create templates. Uh, if any of you interact on the Articulate community forums, if you are Articulate users, you know that there's um, a lot of people out there who share their templates. Or, and I am one of those people. I love to create templates and share it out there. So go out there and find an inspiration and mock up a few slides of content. Uh, and it'll start uh, uncovering, I guess, things in your mind that you didn't know you could do from a graphic standpoint. And then you'll go, oh, I can use the same concept later. Um, 
in a, in a, a real course. And one thing I'll also say, and this, this goes back to my presentation in March at the Learning Solutions Conference, one of my 10 things that I learned is to copy others but make it your own. There is no, uh, there should be no shame in being inspired by other people's work. Um, that's how I've become a really good graphic designer and a good e-learning designer is by imitating what others do. So, of course, go out there, see what other people are doing, reverse engineer it and do it yourself. I think that's the best way to learn anything, e-learning design. And then, of course, take it and make it your own. And before you know it, you'll have your own design aesthetic and your own little tips and tricks for design that you can use yourself. So last part I want to talk about in the last few minutes we have are design trends that people use that you need to stop using ASAP. These are trends that um, were once popular, maybe once popular, and they need to go away today. Stop using them. My first one is bubble and emboss. This is something, I don't even know when, when people started using this. I would say this is probably Windows 95 version of PowerPoint or whatever. Um, the bevel emboss tends to be a really popular design um, when people want to create a button. Uh, it's a little skeuomorphic in the sense that it looks like a real button because it has depth, but uh, it just looks old. It looks bad. It looks weak. It looks amateurish and it looks unprofessional. It doesn't have the same look and feel as it used to be. So stop using bevel and emboss. Second one, glossy buttons. Ugh, I struggle with this one a little bit. Uh, I think the, the day of the glossy button is uh, long gone. I think people are going more towards flat looking buttons or buttons with gradients. Uh, but glossy buttons, you know, and glossy buttons remind me, you remember like in the late 90s or the early 2000s with the, the different colored clear IMAX and then it spun off this whole trend of creating those transparent plastic phones and then you had transparent microwaves that had like the red and then the blue and then, and then you had transparent mice, computer my, mouses, and then you had all these different transparent items. This is what this reminds me of. So glossy buttons. Um, are a little bit old. And yes, Rachel, you see flat design everywhere. Flat design is everywhere. That is the thing right now. I have no idea what will be next after flat design, but it is a very popular design trend right now. Last one, most people, you would like to think most people know this, right? But I get surprised all the time when people make this horrible mistake as they use really bad fonts. Um, this is a great example of this. People who use uh, Comic Sans, yeah, I'm not going to take you seriously. I love this one. It says, please keep the door closed. Someone says, please don't use Comic Sans. We're a Fortune 500 company, not a lemonade stand. That is so true. Uh, some other fonts that I don't like is like Hobo or Papyrus or Chiller. Um, these are fonts that I guess used to be cool because someday some person randomly discovered that you can change fonts and then people started using it all the time. Again, I will say, however, though, if you can find an intentional way of using these fonts, by all means, use them. Uh, for example, I was working, oops, I was working on a template. Um, I don't know why. I got inspired by an Egyptian template. I might be able to use the papyrus font and it might look suiting for that template, but otherwise I would stick away from, or stay away from temp, uh, uh, fonts that look like these. Uh, dramatic gradients. I talked a little bit about gradients earlier. Uh, again, this is a very early 2000s, late 90s trend is to create these really dramatic gradients. Uh, again, this is a design trend that people use just because they learned about that you can create gradients. Doesn't mean you need to use the gradient. Uh, so stay away from dramatic gradients. And then lastly, this one uh, I struggle a little bit on. I call it bad characters. I don't think characters overall are a bad thing. I think if you use a character in your course, whether it's an avatar or whether it's just a cutout image of a person or even an illustrated character. If you use it with intent, uh, it can be done right. But one of the ones that I don't think should be used anymore, these are bean people. They're called bean people, I think. I don't know where people get these, but don't use these. This doesn't help me learn. And then another one that I've never been a fan of is the animated avatars that speak to you and they move around. I, I just think those look cheesy and I think they distract from your content. They don't really do anything to help you. So, uh, that's the presentation. Uh, hey, did you like that video? Make sure to check out some of our other great content at elearningandcover.com.